Uh, hey all, welcome to another webinar by the Product School. Today we'll focus on the topic zero to one versus one to end problem statement as a product manager. Um, before that, I'm Neveta. I'm a senior product manager currently at Delveroo, working on the grocery consumer experience side of things. I'm based out of London. Previously, I started as a um, data scientist and actually an electronics engineer by degree but transition into product management a couple of years back. And since then, there's been no looking back. And um, I worked across a couple of startups back in India, um, namely Flipkart, Sui, Kiofit, um, e-commerce, food tech, and health tech players. Um, that's in brief about me. Today, we will um, firstly focus on what are the different type of problem statements as a product manager, especially zero to one versus one to N. What are the difference, differences between that? How can we approach these sort of problem statement across the product life cycle? And also probably cover uh, one to two case studies to like sort of explain the approach that I followed and also quickly recap before we close up. Um, starting with what, what are the different type of problem statement? Let's demystify that, right? So um, zero to one and one to end problem statements generally differ based on the nature of the problem in itself. Um, to detail a little bit more, zero to one means building something that did not exist previously in the same form, in the same domain or organization or a business model. Say for example, you're starting a new business from scratch or you are in an organization that is looking to pivot to a new business model. Say for example, um, Deliveroo starting groceries is one example. Um, and there might be other such examples as well, which helps the uh, company or an organization move to say a different market, different scale, et cetera. One to N is a type of problem statement where you're basically having a foundation built in but you're trying to work on improving it, iterating it, or scaling something that already exists. Um, let me give an example, right? So say, for example, you're working in a, a B2C organization which, which has a consumer funnel, and uh, you're working on optimizing one part of the consumer funnel in terms of conversion, uh, growth, et cetera, or think about a personalization problem, which is um, a sort of a one-to-end problem statement, you could say. And also in terms of say logistic networks or food tech players, I think improving on optimization efficiency of these logistic network is a part of one to end problem statement. Um, let's now go to like sort of how do, how do we like move towards, um, how do you understand these? And probably one framework that we can use to understand the difference is like, let's go through the product, uh, software product lifecycle, I would say. And um, to ensure we're all on the same page, I'm sure most of you here uh, are aware of these concepts. Uh, to ensure we are going to revisit this concept again and again through the next set of slides, uh, it could help to align on the same points. So starting with um, one of the key components of a software product lifecycle is the product discovery. So this is a space where you come up with, okay, this is the problem. Uh, does the, does it, is it actually a user need uh, where you solve it through user research? You try to do impact sizing. That's also part of the product discovery. Um, we go through a couple of ideation, brainstorming sessions to figure out what, how to approach this problem uh, and probably going into like sort of prototyping usability study to like sort of nail down on certain details of the product. So this is where we could say is that all of this comes under the product discovery phase. Second is execution. So once you have had the initial understanding of what the solution looks like, uh, you get into, okay, these are the 10 things that we want to solve. And this is how the product prioritization looks like. And say things like planning it for, like say in a sprint agile mode or in roadmap phases, and also working with design software developers, DS, ML, et cetera, in terms of requirement grooming, and as well as um, flushing out, say Q, QA test cases, bug bashing, backlog grooming, all of it part is a part of the execution um, phase. The third one is a collaboration phase where um, uh, it can happen in parallel as well with the execution phase, where you try to work around with the different stakeholders of the business, let it be like marketing, ops, finance, business, uh, et cetera. You also try to work across different cross um, product teams, like say consumer teams, working with logistics teams, et cetera. If you're in a marketplace, you have like more players involved. So that comes under the collaboration as well. And also another key part of collaboration is where you keep 
uh, the entire team updated, keep a progress tracker, etc. Um, the last part of the product lifecycle is a launch and iterate phase, where in where we could say things around experimentation, deeper analysis, uh, iterating on the launch in itself, figuring out if we would want to expand, kill, uh, scale, etc., and also probably looking out for improvements, which goes back to your backlog grooming and also keeping a focus on consumer feedback as you launch and iterate. So some of these process is not linear. It's most of these processes are not linear. Some of these are like in loops. Um, you might go from one phase to another, etc. So reason for touching upon this is a like to like sort of touch base on this as we go into the next set of case studies. Um, so now let's start with a case study. Right. This is uh, one of the example um, that I worked on uh, in when I launched uh, a product back in Kyofit. Kyofit is an organization or a, it's a health tech player. So um, I'll quickly uh, walk you through what the business problem was, what the problem statement was. I don't go too much into the detail of the solution, but rather try to uh, explain through a product management or the product lifecycle what differed for a zero to one here. Right. Um, Quickly, quick uh, view on what the product looked like. So uh, imagine we were in, this was back in 2020 when COVID hit. So the business was having a lot of problems in terms of, and one of the biggest business that got hit was the health gyms, etc. So CureFit had this physical gym that was the main source of revenue. But since COVID, we had to like sort of move from the offline setup to an online setup. Um, firstly, that itself was the biggest challenge. Second, the consumer behavior, because not most consumers were used to the online setup and where you work out through a, a digital space, right? So business problem. What was, the, what was the key focus that we wanted to do as a company and as a product team, right? So first thing was, how can we like sort of move from an offline to an online and probably ensure we still run the business and get the revenue that we need? Um, we wanted to ensure a couple of things that we want to ensure was keeping the consumer experience intact and probably driving at least partial part of the revenue. So while I hope you understood like what the scenario was and to go a uh, slightly deeper into what we did end up uh, building, one of the thing of after a lot of ideation and strategic calls, et cetera, we landed up on building one of the biggest uh, profitable offline mode of um, uh, health offering that we were having at that point in time is personal training. So basically personal training is a setup where a trainer like works with a consumer on a one-on-one -on -one setup. Um, and it was one of the biggest part of the revenue. So what we had to do was how can we bring this to a digital setup? So this by the nature of the problem statement and the scenario itself is a zero to one problem. So basically there was no online experience before this. So we had to build the entire online experience zero to one. Um, next, I think uh, we had to like sort of ensure um, we continue building on the revenue and as well as keep in power the consumer experience and also build the capabilities that's required to like sort of build this or run the show on an online setup. So zero to one again. So what did we build? Um, so given uh, from a problem statement, you will understand there are two pieces of play here. So one is a trainer, one is a consumer. So we had to build the entire uh, structure from a trainer and the consumer side of view. So, um, uh, and some of the key components that we had to build was in terms of how can a trainer set their own uh, slots, time booking for consumers, and how can the consumer choose a slot to book. Second, from a consumer experience, how can we like, they, they had variety of offering in an offline setup in terms of you can choose uh, a boxing class or a dance class or a yoga class, et cetera, in a personal training. So we wanted to like sort of make sure we build uh, uh, an approach to the product which made sense for the consumer, but also ensured they had an offline setup. So there were certain things that could not fit into this mode. Um, thirdly, we also wanted to ensure that the marketplace works seamlessly. Um, while going through all of these, uh, I'll be walking you through how the product lifecycle went, but without uh, going into the solution, the problem space in itself was complex because firstly, um, I'll go through the five, five parts, right? So um, going to the product discovery phase and execution, et cetera, uh, what we did understand was uh, this is not the eventual, at least from my experience, having worked in mostly one to end sort of problems, zero to one differed basically because you did not have the foundation 
uh, behavior that you needed from a consumer side. So starting with product discovery. So um, always, I think what helped us like sort of nail down on uh, where do we start with building the solution was trying to firstly understand what are the user problems and user needs. Well, this does not, this I think would be iterated in most of the uh, pieces across product management. I think this is the key focus when we had to start from zero to one. While strategically we wanted to build in something that came from offline to online, but on ground, what we understood was users are not used to doing this on an online setup. So starting with actually what the problem user problems are and the user needs are. And second, uh, doing an intensive market research solely because it's a new concept. We did not know if there was um, uh, a market for this. Second, uh, it is because we do not want to build something that we had a hypothesis on, but rather is there a need for the market or something around this lines. Has this been done anytime in the past? Like market research helps us understand um, uh, all of these aspects. So basically the market size, total addressable market, et cetera. Um, these two parts should be a key focus in your product discovery piece. Um, and the third one, I would say um, while doing this, uh, one of the thing that we had understood was given there's a new idea, like there was always idea paralysis. You might, you might have heard of the term called analysis paralysis, but we had an idea paralysis. What it means is there are so many stakeholders, a new concept. So can we do this? Can we do that? Can we like sort of bring in this new innovative idea? All of these had was a part of our product discovery phase as well. But what did we do? We had to like sort of firstly, as a product manager, I think it's very, very important to set the right set of product goals and philosophy or a product principle that you want to achieve. And for us, we nailed it down to one key aspect, bring the offline to online, keeping in part the consumer experience. So the first key aspect is to first start driving revenue and then building on innovation later, right? Like innovative uh, virtual experiences later. So that was very, very important. And second, um, we also had to like sort of align this across the team, which shouldn't be that um, the tech works differently from the marketing, et cetera. So I'll be touching upon this as well as we go down the other slides. So I think it's important to align this across different parts of the business. So I would say to summarize this slide, I would say keep an eye for product market fit. When we mean product market fit, I think there's a term that would be used across. Um, I think zero to one, one of the ways to say, yes, the idea worked or the hypothesis worked or the solution worked is through ensuring product market fit. When we say product market fit, it says, yes, there is adoption for this part of your uh, service and consumers actually like it. And for sure, I would refer you to a book called Lean Product Playbook by Dan Olson on, because he's detailed out the product market fit funnel very, very in depth. So um, coming back to product market fit, one of the key aspect again is to figure out um, if you have hit the product market fit and one of the metrics probably that could help you drive is retention. So once you have a recurring consumer base, it's when you can like sort of say, and that number differs for different businesses, but you have to have a benchmark. And that's when you say, yes, your zero to one is sort of clicking in. Second, uh, from an execution perspective, I think one of the things that we had faced with when we built this challenge is uh, we had to ship fast. Uh, because we all, we were already COVID hit, revenue was getting hit, so we had to like sort of get back on the ground with the online experience as soon as possible. And this is where one of the oh, two framework that helped us. Firstly, like how can we use reuse existing capabilities, and which is why all the more it's important to build your tech and work with the tech team to like sort of build capabilities. So we had. Um, to like sort of go through the entire consumer funnel and services to understand what are the existing capabilities that we can use in a quick manner, of course, not completely hacking, but like in a quick manner so that like we get to the minimum viable or minimum allowable product as soon as possible while iterating on it. So we wanted to get early feedback rather than wait and build an exhaustive product. So that was the first step. Second, I think um, on the capabilities piece, some of the times you might have need the things that you might not already have, like especially when we're going online and virtual. Um, so we had to go with, uh, we, we couldn't build the end. Like there is a choice to build versus buy, right? So it's always a complex decision. Do we want to build it in-house or do we like sort of work with uh, different SaaS players to like sort of get this going? And this is a key aspect in zero to one. And whenever you're in a decision dilemma on like, should we spend in so much time? It's going to take so much effort, but it's all scalable. I would surely suggest going via this curve to figure out, can we do a buy versus a build? 
Um, so that helped, that helped us a lot. Second, in terms of requirements, I think um, it's so easy in a zero to one to like sort of get scope creeped while it's common across, but it's more common in zero to one. Um, solely because um, of the um, sheer amount of ideas and probably ambiguous nature of the problem space, which is all the more reason as a product manager, it's important to have focused requirements. What is the exact requirement? What is it driving as a goal? Is something that we need to be like really, really crisp and clear on, rather than like trying to figure out like different hundred different parts of the service in itself. Third, um, I think while agile sprint sort of a mode works for most of uh, the businesses, I think um, being flexible in the way that you work towards a zero to one will be really helpful. You're working as a start in a startup mode, right? So um, you wouldn't want to have this like set two weeks, three weeks time frame, and you want to only work in that time frame, right? So you might want to be like sort of agile and flexible in some of these concepts or methodology in which the team works. And it should, and I think it also helps to like sort of reprioritize and kill ideas as soon as possible rather than waiting for the entire build, et cetera. So I think this was something that we had to, as a team, get into uh, as a process for while we built, while we shifted from non COVID time to a COVID time and like sort of shift faster. So that helped us. Um, third, in, in terms of collaboration. So um, one of the key aspects in zero to one is that. Um, we need to work with different aspects of the business. And one of the key things for sure as a product manager is you have to wear the hat of a product marketing and plan for it since day one when your idea launches, because it isn't, there is no point of uh, working and building something the consumer need, but do not you do not know how to actually, when you have built a product, go and sell it to the consumers or get the traction for that. So you need to build your product marketing from day one and also probably think about what are the different ways in which your purchase model works is it going to be a freemium is it going to be a premium etc to ensure that your revenue is also in place and you're not always offering a free product um second i think in terms of collaboration uh one thing that could help in a zero to one when you're working on big bets etc is uh small and focused teams rather than like trying to have multiple teams typically a nature when you have a uh, bigger teams right so you have to work across different cross teams and um this sort of a structure could help reduce um clash on the roadmap prioritization etc and you as a team work as a a pod in itself and that helps um reduce um uh, any any uh overlaps third i think um as a team i think uh it's important to be aligned on the philosophy which is what i touched upon briefly in the previous slide as well so collaboration in terms of collaboration i think um all of the team members like including the business counterpart should be aligned on what the outcome is there's no point building something in a product and then product marketing is using some other concept and the the whole thing goes for a toss. And in fact, this is something that we learned from experience. In, when we did launch the first version of it, we had slight challenges or changes in terms of what was what we were trying to market versus what we had built as a product. So we had to learn course correct on this. Um, so it's important to keep this from the, uh, from the start. On the launch phase, uh, one of the important things from a zero to one is uh, being able to experiment, learn, iterate. So this loop keeps continuing as long as you sort of hit your PMF and your goal metric. Um, and as a team, it's important to like have this philosophy rather than like say, okay, I've launched, I'll move on to the next one. So that is a big no. For a zero to one, I think as a team, you might need to have this mindset that we would be like sort of experimenting, learning, iterating and killing wherever required. And that loop keeps continuing. So I think as a team, when we were aligned that we had set these processes as a PM, I've said this process that like, okay, let's do an experimentation, but we should be willing to like sort of course correct, learn, iterate on top of it. Uh, and being very specific on what the experiment success looks like is very, very important. Second, in terms of launch, um, given these are more high level vague uh, hypotheses that you have, Ensuring you reduce a blast radius is really, really important. So when we say experimentation and blast radius, I think these are running, let's say, in a small subset of consumers or a small set of market. So when we did launch it, we had this key market that we had in a part of a city in India, and we had to like we tested all our uh, hypotheses in one specific set of location in a couple of a uh, couple of areas. So and that helped us like sort of hypothesis course correct and reduce uh, any impact negative impact and reduce the blast radius as well third in terms of innovation 
Um, I think uh, one of the key things that's really, really important from a zero to one is you have to have your early consumer feedback on every stage of your journey. So you can like sort of think about what are the different innovative ways to get consumer feedback. And one of the things that we had built in was um, we were completely tied up with the consumer support team when we built the entire, entire uh, product. Um, we were always in love with the consumer support team in terms of trying to get any feedback that comes out with respect to this particular product sent to us, working on all of these feedback, anecdotal, et cetera. So that was one way. Another way we tried to do was um, we had regular walk-ins for consumers to like sort of say Thursday consumer chats and we used to bring in consumers and like we used to like uh, sort of talk to them um, and actually going and specifically talking to attributed users. I think it's really, really important because um, you get your early feedback as well as you understand what's not working with it, uh, with, with your service. And also one more innovative way we try to like sort of go is um, uh, through a CRM mode. So basically like sort of uh, getting as much as survey in pos possible across the consumer journey. So consumers were interacting with trainers. So can we like sort of pop in uh, uh, user friendly and easy to use surveys and like sort of get more feedback as soon as possible. So that was the third point. And this fourth point was, um, I think key, uh, set and track your key metrics like a hawk. So I think it's really, really important to be on top of your key metric and also defining the right set of metrics uh, for your launch. And that's up to the product teams and the DS team to like sort of work together to like figure out what are the key metrics that you want to track. Um, throughout the entire journey, I want to touch upon some of the attitude or soft skills that I would call, like, um, which helped us go through the entire journey. Firstly, um, I wouldn't iterate this more, but um, uh, aligning the entire team on the key goals because the last thing you want to have is autonomy without alignment. So you wouldn't want to work like you wouldn't want the team, all of them, to work in different directions, but without an alignment, right? So this is the last thing that you want to have. So aligning the entire team on the key goals is important. Second, I think uh, working through ambiguity, given the nature of zero to one sort of problems, um, ambiguity is by nature going to be heavy because firstly, as a product manager, you're not going to be very clear on what exactly is the problem space that you want to work on. Is it going to, which one comes in first versus second because you don't have an impact sizing because it's completely new. So you might want to take, you might take these calls, which is more subjective and hence you have ambiguity and hence you, it is, responsibility of the PM to like sort of limit the chaos with the ambiguity and drive through the ambiguity with clarity. So ambiguity can be within one layer, but it shouldn't percolate to the entire team. Um, third, I think if in case you're working on a competitive space and more so zero to one problems, you might want to always keep velocity as a key. So basically you want to ensure you go to the market faster, explore, experiment, learn, and then course correct rather than wait for like six to one year to build something and then test your hypothesis. Um, last but not the least, yeah, never, never goes over like the consumer voice, try to do like all sorts of consumer feedback as early as possible and through the entire consumer journey and don't keep it to the last. Um, try things around like say fake door testing. So toss around if in case uh, if a consumer is like trying to like sort of adopt to a service and we've tried it in the past. Um, ensure that the pricing, etc., is also um, adaptable for consumers. So that was another key piece that we had to work through and I trade multiple times after our launch. So that was one learning that I would redo if I have to redo this again. Um, and yeah, there comes an end to like um, the zero to one problem statement, but I want to call out that what did we achieve after all of this, right? And this was a close to a five to six months um, uh, build and launch and iteration. The first launch went, went within like two months, but we had to iterate and like we had a retention of close to 65% plus, uh, which is a pretty good retention number for consumers in uh, online personal training. Next, let's go to a next, let's switch gears and move to another case study, right? Um, this is, um, I'll set up the business context again, given we are context switching a common problem for problem uh, PMs, right? So um, this is um, at Swiggy. Swiggy is a food tech uh, company back in India. Um, it was at that point in time serving close to 25, 50 plus com uh, cities, but it had soon expanded to 300 plus cities. One of the problem statement, this was pre-COVID, this was close to 2018. Um, we had to work on profitability and like, oh, that was a problem statement that the company was working towards. And I was a part of the delivery team, which means working on team that was working with the writer side of things. Um, 
And so basically we want to improve on how can we like sort of reduce the cost incurred in delivery. And one highlight I want to make regarding food tech is um, it's typically a three-way marketplace. So there's a consumer, there's a restaurant, and there's a rider. So, um, so when a consumer places order, so there are two moving parts, the restaurant is going to be preparing the food and the rider is trying to get your food delivered. So let's go into what the problem statement was, right? So given it's more nuanced and I, we might need to like sort of deeply focus on what the problem statement is, like slightly more uh, complex one. So um, the current state was, um, given there's a one-to-end problem, uh, reminding you, uh, we had, we, we were across a couple of cities, we had, uh, existing rider network, restaurant network, and consumers ordering, so say a few millions of consumers, right? Um, and uh, the issue that we had was uh, typically when a food is placed, uh, there's a, in the graph that you can see here on the right, so you have two parallel processes, one process, which is talking about the preparation time, so the restaurant is preparing your food, but you wouldn't want to wait till your food is prepared for your rider to go to the restaurant, right? So there's this huge intensive complex logic that runs behind to figure out which rider can go into uh, the restaurant and pick your order and who can also deliver to you. So this logic, let's say it's called the assignment logic. So what it does is trying to figure out the best rider who can go and take your item and deliver to you. The challenge that we had here, though, from a cost incurred while delivery is because now that the problem statement that we have is reduce the cost that's incurred in the delivery. So which is the second part of the um, uh, parallel line that you can see here. So rider goes from a space that they are in to the restaurant that they are allocated to, wait for a couple of times, most of the times, uh, to get the food prepared and then delivered to you. So basically, there's a first mile, which is going to the restaurant, there's wait time, and then the last mile. So here, the problem statement that we wanted to like sort of go towards and address as a part of the delivery team is how can we like sort of optimize this? And if you think about it, right, like if you give it a thought, the wait time that happens in the restaurant is completely um, an unutilized part for a rider because you're just waiting there. For restaurants as well, it's just too much crowding in the place. It's not helping the rider. It's not helping the consumers. It's not helping the restaurants. It's neither helping Swiggy because every minute of wait time is paid to the rider. So there's a cost, unnecessary cost involved here. So we wanted to see how can we like sort of go deeper into this and like sort of solve, optimize for this and the way to optimize for it. Um, I wouldn't go deeper into solution, but quickly touching upon it, we had to predict what time the food can be prepared and accordingly allocate, which is a pretty complex operation research problem. And it is not just one rider, right? So you're going to have like millions of riders, millions of consumers, across different restaurants solving at the same time. So you need to have, it's a huge optimization problem. So I'll keep the solution aside. And there's this huge blog that we have written to like sort of for you to understand. So do go through the reference at the bottom here, but this is a one-to-end problem. And what are the different challenges that we faced here, right? Um, if you observe this, it looks like a backend logistics uh, optimization problem, but in fact, it was not. Um, if in case we had to change anything related to the wait time, first thing we had to change was uh, for the restaurants, um, the behavior of the restaurant was typically that they were assured that the rider is there so that they start preparing because they don't want to deliver cold food. So they don't want to, they don't want to prepare food and keep it and wait for the rider. So when we are changing the assignment time, so the, the confidence that the restaurants had that we are going to allocate on time was reducing. So we had to change the behavior from a restaurant side. Second, from a consumer side, think about how it gets impacted, right? So typically, if you've placed an order on a food tech platform, you would know that like as soon as you place an order, you want to see the first status change on your tracking screen, is it not? So the first change here at that point in time at Swiggy was getting your rider allocated. So that was the assurance for consumers that the food is on the uh, food is anyway going to come to them. So having said that, changing anything related to the assignment time for the rider was impacting consumers directly, or that was a hypothesis. So given it looks like an optimization problem, it was impacting all three parts of the funnel. And hence, we had to like sort of go very, very deep into every aspect to like sort of nail this down. And let's go now how into how, how did we do that, right? So again, I'll walk you through the entire journey and probably we'll discuss what's different from the zero to one. Uh, starting with the product discovery. 
I think, uh, as I mentioned, and as I went, if you had observed, we went from, okay, Swiggy, profitability and delivery team, wait time. So we went so much in depth. So going down to the problem street and kneeling down to the depth is very, very important in a one-to-end because you're not working on a zero-to-one anymore. You're working on a specific aspect of a specific service on a specific leg. So you might want to like sort of kneel to the bottom. And for you to kneel to the bottom as a PM, you need the exact strategic need and detailed understanding of what the consumers are, what the downstream impact is, et cetera. So which drives me to the second point, going deep with the current experience funnel or impact metric. So trying to understand not just at a high level, okay, this is the wait time, but why does the wait time happen? What changes when a wait time happens? And what is it changing the restaurant? Is it changing consumers? How does it impact profitability? Can we reduce for some set of, uh, restaurants and not have it for others. What's the changes there? So I think going to the depth um, of uh, these metrics and understanding these in depth helps. Um, so try to focus also on your impact estimation. It's pretty almost most of the times you would be able to, in your product discovery phase of one to n figure out an impact estimation. Okay, what is the probable uh, wait time reduction that we could get if in case we reduce, say, or optimized by X percent, right? Uh, either via guesstimate or via deeper analysis, you should be able to get an impact estimate. And why it's important? It's important to keep your focus on one specific metric and track it keenly to ensure you're not deviating from the main topic, right? And uh, third, uh, thinking about scalability is really, really important. Um, if you need, uh, 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 say for example, uh, in this aspect, while we were building this logic, Swiggy was growing from a 20 to a 200 plus cities. We wouldn't, and it took us six months and like six to nine months. So um, in that time frame, you wouldn't want to build something that's just fitting into the current scale. You want to think about scale and keeping scale in back of the mind is very, very important in one-to-end problem statement. So to summarize, I think I for the specific goal and having defining the right set of target metrics is very, very important in a one-to-end and going to the depth. Second, from an execution perspective, um, I think uh, one mindset that held us uh, was what brought you here may not take you to the next step. So we didn't have what need, what it needed for Swiggy to like sort of deliver food and almost all the time like was a good one with a good consumer experience score. But what are we trying to do here? We were trying to like sort of optimize on top of it without impacting the current baseline. So what took us here did not take us to the next step, which is why um, Con- contradicting to the zero to one, zero to one, you want to like sort of try to reuse existing capabilities because you're testing and shipping it faster. Here, you might want to like ensure what's existing now may not take you to the next step. So trying to build on intelligence and capabilities. Intelligence here might be things around say, here it was an operation research problem and optimizing on top of it and bringing more innovation uh, was one, one step, right? Second, uh, trying to work and plan for enhanced metric, like. Uh, um, and also trying to ensure what are the trade-off metrics. Given you already have a baseline experience built, you're trying to win it. whenever you're trying to like sort of build something, say growth versus profit, etc. You always have a trade-off, right? So which is why it's important to define the right set of success metric and check metric. When we say check metric, what is the non-negotiable for your uh, changes that you're trying to do? So here for us, it was we are trying to improve on the profit or the cost per delivery, but also not impacting anything related to the consumer experience, restaurant or the uh, consumer or the rider experience, right? So we want to keep that intact as much as possible, but also defining the right set of consumer metrics. It, you cannot always track, okay, if the consumer experience metric was how many users got it within 30 minutes or 40 minutes should not be the only number right now because we're trying to optimize um, Probably before 80 percentile of your users, we're getting it within a specific speed. But now you're trying to optimize for the entire network. While the average might remain similar or even higher, you're you're impacting the entire network. So that was a key aspect that we wanted to like sort of um, try to work towards and also align leadership and stakeholders on this point of view, because this is a changing behavior. There's a new metric which actually talks about more depth about the consumer experience. So we had to bring bring this into picture. So uh, I think it's important as well to go uh, to the entire details of the requirements while this is pretty straightforward. Uh, in a one to win, in a zero to one, it's while you have ambiguous uh, nature of the business and you might be willing to like sort of work with a very high level requirement, 
in a one to one i think given that you have a very very specific problem it's always important to nail down the details because it is going to take some time for you to implement and you don't want to end up with the wrong requirement at the end and take 6 months to build something or 4 months to build something and then change it right so put in as much as a pm put in as much as possible on, and wear your hat on attention to details to defining these requirements going to the depth thinking about all the stakeholders all the different parts of the marketplace if you're working on a marketplace etc third collaboration right what changes um as i said as i was defining this change consumer behavior restaurant behavior i think you would be put up with a challenge you're challenging the status quo and this is something that's always um a difficult in difficult situation so you might want to like sort of be very very clear in terms of how you're collaborating with different stakeholders keeping them in loop in terms of what's changing what what might have as an impact and how you're monitoring to keep uh to ensure that you're not impacting different parts of the business in a different way in our example i think there was there were teams that were very very um uh conscious on how we were looking to build the consumer behavior so we had to like sort of work with them align with them and keep them in loop in terms of how we are approaching the problem statement and how we are not interacting or impacting consumer experience in a negative way second i think it's important to have um you're going to have multiple downstream impact and hence it's important to have cross team collaboration early on and deep, go deeping deeper into the user stories so here example restaurant the restaurant uh changes would have been missed if in case we had not consciously tried to like sort of think through what are the different downstream impact what's impacting what's changing etc and we had to like sort of go and have specific brainstorming sessions to understand what happens outside of this logic third embrace failure you're going to have a lot of it uh, because these are like uh, it happens both across 0 to 1 and 1 to n but in 1 to n uh, the problem is like you already have a baseline and it's easy for people to go back and say let's just continue as we are right and you you might uh, have that issue time and again and you might want to go back to the drawing board as a team and embrace your failure and learn from it uh, which is why it's all the more important to build a team that has this mindset and also like as as a pm it's important to communicate this with your team to understand why it's okay to fail and like sort of learn from it because some failures consistently also puts the team in a um, in a mode where it's difficult to uh, continue further next um on the launch i want to surely touch upon uh, how how this differs from 0 to 1 in a in a one to n sort of a setup um you might uh, and especially in this example that i mentioned it's an optimization algorithm it has network economics playing into it um simpler ab sort of an experimentation was not something that we could go with uh, because it's not a user level separation what we're trying to optimize is network network level optimization so what we understood was as i mentioned in the previous point on execution current uh, capabilities did not help us um, and we have to build a robust experimentation methodology or a simulation platform to specifically uh, test our hypothesis with respect to optimization every time we tweak a part of the optimization how does it change for the on the on ground how is it impacting the wait time right so uh in fact if i have to give you a good uh, insight we had to go with four to five different methodologies of experimentation and we also were willing to learn from different counterparts across the globe to figure out because these were very unique problem and we were one of the uh, first few companies to try to sort of figure out uh, this sort of an implementation and also test that right so simulation is uh, was an easier option but we didn't go with simulation because uh, it does not actually replicate what's on ground while it's directionally good we had to like sort of build an experimentation which works at a network economics level basically one rider would be having an algorithm which is trying to optimize wait time while the other does not and like it's uh, and you can understand right so like it's it's a pretty complex network economics that's playing here so we had to go with uh, being be open to like sort of experiment explore different options uh, on how we can like sort of uh, understand the impact so that was the first step and we were okay to do this and this itself consumed us more than like 6 to 7 iterations of how we are experimenting second on the scalable experiments um so basically as i mentioned before on the scalability aspect um so given that this is an established business you wouldn't want to build experiment that just runs for runs a for a long time but it's only probably feasible within a particular zone 
in contrast to what I said in zero to one, you might want to build something that like you've tested in two to three cities, but you're able to like sort of expand it to probably like the entire 500 plus cities that you're currently launched towards. So the time to go to market should be reduced for sure, given the impact of it. Third, uh, always be on top of consumer experience and this never gets old. Um, one thing that I wanted to call out here was the difference in consumer experience might be slightly uh, more towards quantitative because you already have a scale and you already have consumers. So anecdotes and sample sizes might not would, would be helpful, but it might not be the entire picture. So you might want to go more quantitative and try to figure out based on probably DS metrics, analytics metrics, uh, on how the consumer experience are changing. And as I pointed earlier, uh, we were trying to work on uh, customer support and metrics around those. So to summarize, right? Like uh, what did help us with one to n? Um, I think patience, grit, and resilience is key. Uh, it's very, very important in one to n. The entire project that I spoke about took us more than nine to ten months, including all the challenges that we faced at the restaurant level, then building things for restaurant, then building for things for riders, etc. Uh, and of the entire cross collaboration. No, I don't have to tell about that, right? So. It did take a lot of time, but it'll be very, very worth it. And when I say worth it, we did save um, a lot of millions of dollars for Swiggy based on this project. Uh, and it's something that's scalable, so it still exists as much as, much as um, uh, cities that they're expanding to, the logic still exists. So second, uh, be ready to have a team downtime. And I mean that, um, uh, what I mean by that is that uh, there might be scenarios where the team motivation fails because you're working on something for a very long time. It's a hockey stick success that you're going to have. So you're going to wait, work on it for six to nine months, and then you get the impact in the last two months, right? So this is where you might need team members who can strive through, have, have the patience, or you as a product manager sort of pull in the team through such time frame as well alongside your engineering managers. Third, velocity is important, as we touched upon before, but velocity is not the only thing. You need to have sustained gains. What I mean by that is you have to keep monitoring your changes. And once you've launched, you shouldn't stop there. So the reason why uh, when we did launch this and there were like consistent um, uh, skepticism or in terms of the consumer impact that we were creating, is it negative, is it OK, etc. So we had to have a holdout group for six months and con consistently monitor there was no negative impact. And that's how consumer focus we were at that point in time. And last but not the least, I think um, you need folks who can like sort of give and take constructive feedback. So there were times where we were like actually in a war room and like sort of trying to figure out uh, what was the thing that we could have done differently and being objective about it is really, really important. And the learning never stops. So we had folks coming in from different parts of the world, like so to, uh, to help us like sort of improve on it, PhDs, et cetera, like especially on this particular project. So that was another last point. So having said all of this, right, these are the compare and contrast between zero to one. Uh, life is not always uh, black and white, right? So there's always gray area. So I want to touch upon that a lot of these aspects is not one size fits all. So there might be scenarios where you might be working on a combination of zero to one or one to end problems, and which is one of my current scenarios. So I'm currently at Delvero building the consumer experience for grocery. And we have in the last one year improved the consumer experience a lot, but there's a long way to go as well. And like we are working towards um, building an experience which has both zero to one sort of a problem and one to end, and which is where your hat to keep shifting between zero to one helps and also driving the team alongside that. So when, when, when you're working on certain things, which is zero to one, you want to go explorative and then converge. But when you're working on one to end, you might want to go very, very deep. And this sort of switching gear as a skill is really, really important as a product manager. Hopefully, my um, uh, talk helped you. And please feel free to reach out to me on my LinkedIn. Thank you.